Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes, the podcast with hot takes on food media. We interview popular chefs and food personalities, sample all kinds of food media, and try cooking challenges in our own kitchens. Let's dig in. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. Welcome back <laughs> to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We took a very short hiatus and uh it was very nice and uh we let our minds wander and think about what we wanted our our time to be like together including with you the listener Mm -hmm. and uh what it's going to be like going forward and i love what we've come up with and i i personally hope it encourages folks listening at home to jump into their kitchens and share even more with us what they've been cooking Yes, it's pot appetit, but different, but also a little bit the same. It's a little from column A, a little from column B. We're turning up the volume on some things we'd already done in the past cooking-wise and talking about food media we enjoy. But yeah, we're introducing some new elements that we think you guys will want to get in on too. That's right. Speaking of what we've been cooking. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We're uh, jumping into it right now, but it's not the old uh, what we've been cooking from, from days of yore. This, is... this ain't your grandma's what you've been cooking. <laughs> now we've got themes, challenges, <laughs> yes. and this is where you can join us too. So since this has been the month of February, now it's the end of February, we've had two major tent poles in this month to celebrate, Valentine's Day and the Super Bowl. So we did some things, and actually I don't even know what Meg has done, so Meg... <laughs> Why don't you tell me one of the things that you've done this month? Yes, so starting out with Valentine's Day, I was invited to a Galentine's Day potluck. So yeah. in case you don't know, Galentine's Day was popularized by Parks and Rec. It's just a sort of Valentine's type celebration, but for girlfriends, platonic girlfriends. So it's like, oh, hey, let's enjoy and appreciate the women in our life and just kind of hang out type of thing. It's still very much in the Valentine's theme of like love. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I thought of some of your standard Valentine's foods, but more like in the color scheme, Mm -hmm. pinks, reds, that type of thing. So I made a couple of recipes. The first one was a cake. It's lemony olive oil cake with strawberry glaze. This I took from a cookbook called Snacking Cakes by Yasi Arefi. Mm-hmm. And the premise of this cookbook is that they're very quick, very easy, smaller sized cakes. That's why they're called snacking cakes. It's mm-hmm. it's not your triple layer cakes or whatever. <laughs> but since I was going to a party with about a dozen people, I did in this case double the recipe. Most of the recipes in this cookbook do have options for scaling it up. So it was really easy to double. It was not that many ingredients. The stars of the recipe were lemon zest and lemon juice and olive oil, of course. I haven't made many olive oil cakes. Maybe this is maybe this is the first one I've made. I don't remember, but I love an olive oil cake. It's really moist, which is the best thing mm-hmm. you want from a cake, you know? <laughs> super moist, super tasty. And then I made also from that cookbook, the strawberry glaze to go with it, which was just pulverized uh, freeze-dried strawberries with powdered sugar and dairy. And drizzled it over the top, made it in a bunt cake pan. It was great. It was a big hit. I put it on my pink cake stand. I thought it was very Valentine's-y. Oh my god, Meg, I saw a recipe on Pinterest that had like a pulverized freeze dried strawberry thing uh-huh. as well and i thought of you like just <laughs> I, I think i just think of freeze dried strawberries i think of you <laughs> i have made them many a time for this podcast <laughs> but the first one that comes to mind is for those strawberry cupcakes with the vanilla mm-hmm. oreos at the base mm-hmm. from was it nadia bakes or nadia yes. cooks yeah okay uh, nadia bakes But that had freeze-dried strawberries, like, two ways or something. (laughs) (laughs) But regardless, it's it's stuck with me that that, that's your thing. (laughs) And now you've done it again. I, yeah. And freeze-dried raspberries for those loft house cookies. Mm -hmm. Give me the freeze-dried stuff, I guess. (laughs) I gotta get into it. (laughs) So you made a cake for Valentine's Day, too. Yes, it was also a snacking cake. Can you believe that we did not coordinate this? <laughs> we did not. We both made snacking cakes for Valentine's Day. 
I made Jessie Sheehan's Plum Vanilla Upside Down Snacking Cake from her cookbook, Snackable Bakes, right here. Look, Meg, I brought it to show you. See? <laughs> oh, very nice. Not at all being blurred by your face filter settings. <laughs> Can there you we go. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had to touch it to my nose. <laughs> I picked this recipe for Valentine's because I also wanted to make something red and the photo in her cookbook is just very stunning. The plums on top of the cake look all hot, wet, and juicy, just how you want to feel on Valentine's. Mm -hmm. I made a TikTok, uh, and folks have probably seen it by now, but if you're making this at home, yours might look a little different from mine. Uh, while I was following Jessie's recipe, I did make some substitutions. Firstly, it is an upside down cake and I've made one of these before. So I knew I wanted to not just have the fruit hit the bottom of the pan. I wanted a little safety layer of parchment paper mm -hmm. uh, just in case anything got stuck. Uh, she then calls for you to spread a fourth a cup of softened butter on the bottom of your pan. And I used Earth Balance uh, because I don't eat butter and Earth Balance is my favorite non-dairy spreadable. And it's a lot of butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then on top of that, you put a lot of sugar, a whole cup of sugar on top. Oh, wow. Uh, so your plums become caramelized. Got I it. used coconut sugar. It ultimately made the caramelization darker, but no one complained and it was still just as delicious. So you got your butter layer, you got your sugar layer, and then you put on your, your plums, uh, which are cut into half inch wedges. So uh, once that you set that aside, make your batter. There's a tablespoon of vanilla in it for vanilla flavor and no other spices. Mm. Just also more sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I substituted buttermilk uh, with the old plant-based trick of plant-based milk plus lemon juice. And then I used Bob's Red Mill one-to-one -one gluten free flour instead of AP flour. And it worked out great. The, the cake rose. It wasn't too crumbly or dry. It was just so sweet. And the plums were so deliciously sexy and i would make it again for sure <laughs> so saucy yeah so eaten juicy. by a couple people that had uh, also come over not a big party just a couple bros broing out <laughs> <laughs> it also looked very steamy in the video nice waft oh. of steam coming out of the pan yeah so if you want a hot and sexy steamy <laughs> <laughs> celebration i i recommend this cake for sure it sounds like a Fun, easy recipe. It It's almost like a hybrid between a cake and like a dump cake. Mm. Have you ever made a dump cake before? I haven't made a dump cake, but I know Jesse's a big fan of them. That that tracks. That makes sense <laughs> based on what I've seen and know of her recipes. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. And you paired it with some lavender ice cream. Is that right? Yeah, we got ice cream from this local place, Yoga Ert, which is <laughs> vegan, gluten-free, and... Uh, Full of probiotics, like all organic. You know, it's it's LA hippie. LA <laughs> <laughs> ice cream, and yeah, I had a lavender blossom pint, and it went well with it for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> awesome. Ah, uh, did you make something else for another tent pole? I made yet another thing for Valentine's Day. Delicious. Basically, I like to have an excuse to make baked goods that other people will help me eat because. Mm -hmm. My husband notoriously does not eat sweets. So I knew I was going to a party. So I was like, I can make a baked good and I can make something else. <laughs> so I <laughs> decided to make something savory as well. I made beet pickled deviled eggs. And I feel like deviled eggs are a huge hit at parties. I love deviled eggs, but I wanted this one specifically, again, for the color theme. Mm -hmm. These are bright fuchsia pink. And I thought that was perfect for Valentine's Day. So the recipe I got for making the beet pickling liquid for the eggs is from Tin to Table by Anna Hazel. And actually, this is a little preview of some of our upcoming content. We will be having a Reddit talk with Anna on Wednesday, April 19th about this very cookbook, Tin to Table. It's all tinned fish recipes. Tinned fish is so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be talking more about that as it gets closer to April, but... Mark your calendars. Be sure to tune in to that. I am a little afraid of cooking with beets just because they will stain yes. everything. <laughs> but as we learned from 
I think it was Rick Martinez. Yeah. Yes. To put down parchment paper on your work surface and then you won't stain anything. So that's exactly what I did. You just cook up beets, vinegar, sugar, bay leaves, peppercorns, salts in a pan. You heat it up. You bring it down to room temperature. And then you you put your peeled, hard-boiled eggs in the beet pickling mixture and let it sit for up to two days. I mm. Mine was over 24 hours, but not quite two days. But really bright pink, really beautiful. And then for the yolk mixture, I also followed in that same cookbook the smoked salmon deviled eggs recipe oh. minus the smoked salmon part. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it would be great with smoked salmon but it's your pretty basic deviled egg it has mayo vinegar Dijon mustard black pepper and a few things that make it a little bit different is that you mince up some shallot very fine to put in the yolk mixture mm. and then you pipe it in the egg and you garnish it with black sesame seeds and little sprigs of dill Ooh. Yes, it was really good. And I decided to be extra because, of course, I did. And I went to the farmer's market and got some tiny little edible flowers (gasps) and garnished with those as well because I thought that would be very on theme with Valentine's Day. Yes, I did did see like on Pinterest and Instagram lots of edible flowers this Mm -hmm. month. And I'm like, where do people get these? Farmer's market. (laughs) In this case, I can't remember what the flowers were. He told me and I couldn't remember, but they're these little teeny tiny white flowers with yellow centers. So if anyone sees my photo and knows, let me know. Yeah. Ooh, that's so good. I mean, (laughs) I will say, well, deviled eggs. I was going to say, oh, did you make the deviled eggs for Super Bowl party? Because I think those are also a good Super Bowl party staple as well. I think so too. Yeah. And I feel like with the pickling, you could dye them like your team's colors as well. Oh, that would be fun. (laughs) You totally could do that. Yeah. May I go next? Yes. You had something else too. Was it around Valentine's Day? No. This... (laughs) So... Another not so tentpole event <laughs> happened in February. It was I had a birthday. Um, <laughs> Happy birthday! Thanks. It was a while ago now. <laughs> the beginning of February. So long ago. Many years have passed since. <laughs> so I wanted to shout out my honey's sister for gifting me a vintage cast iron teddy bear muffin pan. That's and cute. I'm a little scared to use it. So. <laughs> Everyone send me good vibes. And I know it's like so adorable. It's like literally, it's like a cast iron tray and then indented are impressions of little teddy bears. That's cute. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love it. It's adorable, but I am so scared to use it. What are you afraid of? (sighs) I'm afraid that like, they're just going to come out all headless and deformed. (laughs) (laughs) parts are missing they're just gonna look like i don't know something happened to the bears (laughs) for some reason the first thing i thought of was cornbread do you like cornbread yeah and i have made cornbread recently so i know i've got a recipe that works i feel like cornbread takes to molds pretty well and comes out of molds pretty Mm -hmm. easily maybe try cornbread that's a great idea that's that's the first thing i'm gonna try with it (laughs) yes yeah. Once I figure out, I'm also, okay, I'm still a little cast iron scared. Like, I also have a cast iron skillet that I'm kind of scared to, because of the whole cleaning thing. And I don't <laughs> like. <laughs> well, a friend of the podcast, Jay Kenji Lopez Alt, has a very comprehensive guide to cleaning your cast iron that I would recommend. Yes, I watch. I need to get a, one of his, he recommends a bamboo brush that I need to get. Yes, and he at least makes it sound simpler than other people make it sound. (laughs) I don't know. I can't speak from experience in this case. Yeah, write in to me with good vibes and recommendations for your cast iron care. Oof. See, I'm already. It's a hot topic. We might have to have a how to season your cast iron debate. (laughs) And I'm already feeling the sweat, so I want to like pass it back to you, Meg. (laughs) Okay, I do have one last thing to mention for our February themes. It was around the big game, kind of. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't actually have a Super Bowl party, nor did I watch it, but I love Super Bowl snacks. I love any excuse to eat guacamole is basically what it boils down to. So we had family over a couple of days before, 
I knew they liked Mexican food. I was like, okay, we're going to have a big Mexican food slash kind of Super Bowl themed spread. So made guacamole, Mm. made bean burritos. And the recipe I particularly wanted to talk about was a queso recipe. This is from Sola L. Whaley, everyone's favorite. She authored this recipe back in her Bon Appetit days, those dark, dark days. (laughs) But this (laughs) recipe is called Queso Not From a Jar. So something I like about Sola's recipes is that she, I like how she kind of balances buying pre-made or even like processed things Mm -hmm. and or like junk food a lot of times and incorporating them in her recipes. I think it's a fun way to take a yummy junk foody thing, but then make something else out of it. So basically, it's queso that uses a lot of American cheese, which, you know, is debatably cheese or not, but I love it. I think it's good. I think that's the kind of texture you need for queso is that very melty, very goopy texture. So it has American cheese. It also has Monterey Jack cheese. And then it's got a bunch of stuff in it to sort of kick it up a notch. There's, you know, cayenne, cumin, and what I really like is pickled jalapenos. So you chop up a bunch of pickled jalapenos and you put jalapeno juice in the queso itself. Really tasty. The only thing I don't like about this recipe, and I've made it a couple times, is that you really need to keep it over the heat to keep it in that nice, dippable Uh. queso texture. It cools down very quickly and hardens very quickly. You get a queso brick. Yeah, pretty much. And it even says in the recipe, oh, like the best way to have this is to keep it warm on a double boiler. And I think that might be the only way that you could keep it in this nice silky texture. So that would be my one thing I don't like about this Mm. recipe. But it tastes really good. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Hearing you describe all those cheeses just made my stomach hurt. So I'm glad that (laughs) there's a world. I know... We're very pro cheese on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> Except for me, who's like, owie. <laughs> Go cheese. <laughs> Maybe we can get sponsored by lactate or something. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I mean, like, what a February we've had. It's delicious. Delicious February. March is looking delicious on the horizon. I know. Yeah, so uh, please hit us up on social at pod underscore appetite to share what you've made for Valentine's Day or the big game or some other Mm -hmm. celebration or just celebrating using your your rice cooker for the first time. I don't know, just, yeah, let us know. (laughs) (laughs) Everyday celebrations. Yeah. Uh, Next month, we'll be playing a game of cookbook roulette and (laughs) celebrating March temples. But keep listening to the very end here. So you'll hear all about it and can join in. But right now, we've been cooking. Now it's time for some eating. (laughs) (laughs) Some eating with our eyeballs. Yes, time for the food media we've been consuming. Yeah, so if you're a longtime listener of Pot Appetit, you know that we have our back burner segment, which is where we talk about random food media that we've been enjoying and consuming. So that could be a TV show. It could be a YouTube series, a movie, a book, a podcast. Any type of food media. So that's basically what this segment is. It's like our back burner. We're going to talk about what we've been consuming in the food media realm. We might sometimes talk about the same thing. If we've all been watching it, we might be talking about different things. In this case, we've got a whole smorgasbord of content. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So the first thing I wanted to mention is a movie came out last year, actually, called The Menu. I think this was pretty popular, pretty well received. I bet a lot of you who are listening also watched it. The basic premise is that a young couple travels to this weird remote island to eat at an extremely exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. <laughs> <laughs> this stars Ralph Fiennes, Anya Taylor Joy, Nicholas Holt, John Leguizamo, a few other people. It's a dark satirical comedy. I found it overall very light and very funny, although it does have very dark themes. I think that it well executes on its sort of satirical parody concept. So it can definitely verge into being too dark, but then it swings around and is funny. (laughs) And I see this interesting trend in movies recently where 
that kind of explores class warfare under capitalism. So if you've been watching White Lotus, I think you would like this movie. It's very much like eat the rich, almost literally. (laughs) And in this case, it's kind of normies versus foodies. I just really enjoyed it and I would recommend it. How violent is it? Pretty violent. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the movies with someone who covered her eyes and I was like, are you okay? (laughs) I felt bad because I was the one who recommended we watch it. (laughs) Oh, no. Ah, I mean, I I think it looks interesting. I have also been like sort of straying away from from violent watchings just because like I just want to chill out, you know? (laughs) Understandable. But yeah, I think that's cool that you watch it and rave reviews for Meg. (laughs) I absolutely enjoyed it. Like I said, if you like White Lotus, I think you would like this movie. Different concept, but kind of some of the same themes in a way. Well, I'm bringing something that has opposite vibes. (laughs) (laughs) More cozy vibes and and younger. Um, Well, I haven't finished it yet, but I've been reading this YA novel by Caitlin Hill called Love from Scratch. (laughs) It's about a young girl, Reese, who lands a marketing internship at a wildly popular internet food channel called Friends of Flavor. Yes, it's internet cooking shows with different (laughs) hosts with different specialties and a test kitchen and all. Uh Uh-huh. One day, Reese, due to circumstances, has to appear on camera in a cooking tutorial with another intern, and she finds herself in an internet ship. (laughs) It's, you know, light and fluffy and YA. I'm sure it will have uh, something to say, but I'm not sure advanced commentary on parasocial relationships, but it's a rom com falling for your competition good time. But yes, the setting is right out of BA. So if you want that BA fanfic. <laughs> yes, this genre of fiction is always so entertaining to me. It's often described as fan fiction with the serial numbers filed off, and that's that's what this is you know it's obviously stand-ins for claire and brad whether you liked it or not they were shipped (laughs) by people (laughs) online in bon appetit's heyday it's funny to me also because i don't think i'm this opportunistic but (laughs) i'm also a novelist and author and back in the bon appetit days i'm just like oh this is just going to be a race to see who can be the first to write a Bon Appetit book with the serial numbers filed Mm, off. mm. And I like briefly considered it, but real person fiction is not my thing. So I was like, no, I don't think I need to devote more time to this. And this is not even the only Bon Appetit fanfic novel out there. There are several. Oh, yeah. And like, I literally wasn't intending to be like, oh, I'm going to seek this out. I was at the library just looking to pick something up to read. And I was like, oh, cute. Like, baking YA, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I I didn't read the jacket. I just got it, opened (laughs) it up. And all of a sudden, they're talking about, you know, popular internet (laughs) food Mm -hmm. content. And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Here I am. I do think it would be interesting if someone took that same angle, but did make it in exploration of the para- parasocial relationships we have with YouTube personalities. Yes. I feel like that'd be a more interesting story, maybe. I also want to maybe check out this book called Paris Dallincourt is About to Crumble. And this is a great British bake-off with the serial numbers filed <laughs> off. It's actually the second in a series. It's the second of the Winner Bakes All book series. But the reason why I'm curious about that is... Because I think it might very specifically be James A. Caster on the celebrity version of Great British Bake Off with the serial numbers filed off. (laughs) Just based on the blurb and the illustrated cover. And I'm like, hmm, I just want to sate my curiosity, but I also don't want to read the whole book. So, yeah, there's that. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But I mean, like, yeah, I'll let you know when when I finish it. Uh, I just haven't had time. Like, I want to read it. Like, I... Ugh, you know. Do you have another thing? The other food-related thing that I was watching, it's not a new show. It came out in 2017. It was only one season. But it was new to me, so I thought I would mention it. This is a Netflix Japan show that you can watch on Netflix US if you are also here in the States like we are. It's called Kentaro, the Sweet Tooth Salary Man. So <laughs> the plot, if you can call it that, is that Kentaro is a 
salesman for a publisher, and he has to go to bookstores around Tokyo to sell the publisher's books. And he's a very elite salesman, and he finishes his job early every day so that he can play hooky and go eat dessert at a nearby sweet shop that is close to the bookstores he is visiting. So that's the plot as far as that goes. It's not, it's a comedy. It's it's definitely a comedy. It's not to be taken seriously. Basically, it's a food porn tour of Tokyo. Mm. So every episode is about a certain type of dessert. You've got eclairs, chocolate, parfaits. Also, something I found interesting are some very, very traditional Japanese sweets that probably not a lot of Americans are familiar with. I wasn't familiar with them, and I lived in Japan for a year. For example, mamekan, which is agar agar cubes served with sweet beans and a sweet black syrup. There's also ohagi, which is glutinous rice balls that are packed in that sweet bean paste, the red beans, adzuki beans. It's very beautifully shot. You get a lot of very high def, very close up, slow-mo pictures and video of food. So it's very beautiful. I think if you were living in Tokyo or planning to visit, it might be good for being like, oh, perhaps I would like to check out one of these places. So I think that's the strength of the show. But when I say literal food porn, I don't just mean it in the typical food porn sense. Like there's very, it's very much like, this guy is eating food and practically orgasming. Like, it's it's a weird show. I will just say it's weird. Like, he makes very sexual noises. There's, very, there's a lot of sexual innuendo. There's sexual jokes. So it takes the food porn to a very literal extent. Mm. I understand if that's not your thing. I would not necessarily recommend this to everyone because it is weird. It's weird. I don't know how else to say it. Also, almost every episode... Let's say, for example, he eats this melon-flavored kakigori, which is like a shaved ice, kind of like a Hawaiian shaved ice. And when he eats this melon kakigori, he has this dream sequence, and his head becomes a melon. And he meets a woman who also has a melon head, and they dance together in the streets. And (laughs) something like this happens in almost every episode. Very strange, but, you know, if you are familiar with some of the oddities of Japanese television, you might enjoy it. If you're not, I don't know, you might not enjoy it. Give it it a try! Yeah. (laughs) It's something different, at least, if you are interested in Japanese desserts in particular. Dude, that sounds fun. I'm gonna check that out. (laughs) Were you consuming something else? Yes, my last thing I've been consuming lately, and I'm so late to the party on it, but whatever, um, is the TikTok show Roll for Sandwich by Adventures in Ardia. And I say late to the party because he's already got over 100 episodes and there's like so many other shows like inspired by it, like Roll for Mm -hmm. Milkshake, Roll for Pizza. But this one is, as far as I know, the original. So uh, this gentleman makes his lunch for us by rolling a die or multiple dice uh, for each layer of his sandwich. Bread, main, cheese, (laughs) roughage, which are 2d12 for a variety of veggies, wild magic, which is 1d20 of literally anything you could imagine in your cupboard. Think... Crispy onions, tahine, bacon, or chocolate chips. And (laughs) finally, a D20 sauce roll, which could be a variety of mustards, chutneys, and various mayos and jellies. It's often chaos, especially around the holidays when he added, like, fruitcake and candy canes into the mix. (laughs) Uh, But it's also inspiring. Uh, I hate decision-making, as we will come to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, that's a sneak peek of what's coming up next. (laughs) Yeah, so I, I also watch this and I'm like, that's how I want to make a sandwich. <laughs> just like, yeah, make a list of everything that's in my cupboard and just roll a die. <laughs> so it's D&D meets food making. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that sounds really fun. I'm going to have to check this out, even though it is TikTok and I'm too old for that. <laughs> no, I'm getting you addicted one of these days. <laughs> So if you're interested in any of these things we've talked about that we've been watching or any of the recipes that we mentioned at the top of the episode, I would really encourage you to sign up for our Substack newsletter that will come out in tandem with our new episodes. 
And we'll be sure to include links to all this stuff we've talked about. So go to podappetite.substack.com and you can subscribe to our newsletter there. I will also put links in the show notes for every episode, like always, but podcatchers are weird. They don't always include hyperlinks in the way they should. So instead, go check out our Substack. Yeah, you can respond to us directly there as well. Yep, you can leave comments on every single one of our posts. Awesome. The future. Yes. <laughs> that leads right to our March planning. So first, I wanted to shout out some March tent poles. And I would encourage folks, if you're listening, you're like, oh, hey, I want to get involved with you guys in March. Here are some ideas of things that you could make food for in March. March 8th is the Hindu holiday holy. March 14th is Pi Day. Mm -hmm. And March 17th is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> but what Meg and I have decided to do is play a little cookbook roulette. And it's something that I had talked about on the podcast previously. And yes. I'm like so jazzed that like Meg is interested in it. <laughs> I really love this idea. So not to explain your idea. Do you go want to explain it? it? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. go ahead. So as Justine mentioned in a previous episode, she randomly chooses one of the cookbooks off of her shelf and then in turn randomly chooses a page from said cookbook and then prepares that recipe. So I've already put my cookbooks into a spreadsheet so that I can use a random number generator to pick a cookbook. And then, yeah, we'll see where that takes us. I'm excited to try this out because... I also have a hard time choosing what to make from my cookbooks. I have a lot at this point now. And even if I narrowed it down to one cookbook, there's so many recipes. Mm -hmm. I look at the little post-it flags I've put on my cookbooks and they're just endless. I don't know yeah. why I even bothered. I might as well have just picked the two recipes that didn't interest me, <laughs> you know, and flagged those so that I could skip over them. So, yeah, this will be an interesting way to add some chaos into... <laughs> Our cooking. Yes, exactly. And then roll a d20. No, just kidding. <laughs> yes. Roll for initiative. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely join us if you want to do that or for mm -hmm. any of the tent poles. I mean, we're not going to have a limit of all the things that we're going to cook for the month. And we're going to, of course, check in twice over the month of, of March, as we yes. usually do. So, yeah, drop us a line anytime with uh, what you'll be cooking as well. Mm -hmm. Now on to the end of our episode. <laughs> <laughs> We've reached the end of our new beginning. We've got merch. <laughs> <laughs> Segway queen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we have that new design still, the GB bow. <laughs> yes, our great British Bake Off design. It's really cute. Go check it out. At our Threadless shop, potapetite.threadless.com and we have our newsletter which Meg just talked about but I want to say it again potapetite.substack.com mm -hmm. you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel youtube.com slash at pod underscore appetite thank you for all your support there we are still trying to get some more subscribers leave us some comments anywhere and everywhere you can I'm really excited for this new adventure and then as also meg said some more reddit talks coming mm -hmm. up and yeah if you want more people interviewed let us know we'll interview them too yes we'll do our best <laughs> all right thank you everybody for joining us and we'll talk to you next time bye bye <laughs> Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Go to potappetitpodcast.com for all our episodes and links to everywhere you can find us online. Also, be sure to subscribe to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes on your favorite podcatcher.